Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Institute for Security Studies and to our uh, online audience as well. I'm Lisa Lowe Bordren. I'm a senior research consultant at the Institute for Security Studies and I'll be um, chairing this session this morning on the upcoming elections in Botswana. We have three speakers that I'll, um, I'll briefly introduce all of them, I think, and then we can get the discussion flowing from there. Uh, Peter Fabricius uh, is a journalist, former foreign editor of the Independent Newspaper Group, who has been a consultant in writing, uh, working for the Institute for Security Studies for many years and focusing on foreign uh, policy. Uh, currently also for uh, the Daily Maverick and, and other media. Um, and um, Peter has spent some time in Botswana, in uh, Gaborone, to do some research around these elections that uh, really this time around, I think, has created unprecedented interest uh, around the region. And he'll explain to us why uh, precisely all this interest uh, and the tension uh, around what we can expect on the 23rd of October. Uh, and right uh, to my left is Keith Jeffries. He is a development macroeconomist and financial sector specialist. He's managing director of Econsult Botswana and former deputy governor of the um, Bank of Botswana. You might have seen him here a few weeks ago speaking about Zimbabwe. So Keith, thank you so much for being a regular here at the ISS. Um, his current and recent activities include work on a range of macroeconomic, financial sector and other development policy issues in Botswana, elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia for governments, international organizations and the private sector. He serves on the boards of various financial and non-financial entities in Botswana, Mauritius and Nigeria and is sought after as an economic commentator and analyst. He's currently leading the midterm review of the National Development Plan 11 for the government of Botswana. So he's really the right man to have today to look at the implications of these elections and uh, the economic landscape in Botswana. And then next to Keith, we have Leonard Cesar. He is a political science lecturer at the Department of Political Science and Administrative Studies uh, in the Faculty of Social Science at the University of Botswana. He specialized in the following subjects um, under political science and international relations, comparative politics, Botswana politics, uh, and Africa in the world, security sector governance, introduction to international relations and election politics and reforms. Leonard is an affiliate to SADC and the AU as an election expert and has an experience of election observation and training across the continent. He is currently a facilitator for Democracy Works Foundation, the Botswana office, and a local uh, consultant for International IDEA. Um, to perform the audit exercise for the 2019 general election. So he will enlighten us on all the nitty gritty of this upcoming uh, poll that we had. Before we start, I would just like to remind you to please fill in our evaluation forms that are very important for us at the ISS. Um, and I would also like to thank the ISS Partnership <coughs> Forum the Hans Seidel Foundation, the European Union, the government or governments of Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden and the USA, without which um, these seminars would not uh, take place. Uh, and I'll hand over now firstly to Peter, who will give us a bit of a uh, rundown on how did we get here and what are the main uh, issues on the agenda of these uh, elections. As I said, Peter just came back from some field research in Botswana, so he'll tell us a bit more about that. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Liesl. Thanks very much to our two speakers, um, both of whom I met when I was in Cameroon, which is why they're here. <laughs> so I like their analyses. Um, Botswana's politics have been famously obscure, if you'll pardon the oxymoron, for over half a century because of their mostly um, monotonous, peaceful predictability. 
the Botswana Democratic Party, the BDP, has won all 11 of the elections so far since the first one just before independence in 1965, and comfortably so. Even in 2014, although the BDP lost its popular majority for the first time, falling from about 53% to about 47%, uh, it still won a clear majority of about 17 seats out of 57 in a, quite a small parliament because of the distribution of support within a constituency-based um, first-past-the-post system. But by most accounts, next week's elections on Tuesdays will be different, with pred predictions now ranging from a close BDP victory through a close victory for the opposition umbrella for democratic change, the UDC, to a hung parliament. The greater uncertainty which has been injected into these elections is mainly, I would say, because of the karma factor, the wildest card in this poll. Everything was going predictably smoothly in the transition between President Ian Karma and his anointed Vice President and therefore almost cert certain successor, Mokhitsi um, Masisi. As it became customary in the BDP, Karma resigned some 18 months ahead of elections, allowing Masisi to become President and therefore to gain a significant advantage over his uh, rivals from other political parties through incumbency. At, th at that point, the, the expected smooth transition unraveled. Having slavishly towed the karma line while President Masisi suddenly developed an inconvenient mind of his own, he began reversing policies, many of them dear to karma. These included lifting the complete ban on hunting, which karma had introduced a couple of years before, and in particular allowing hunter, hunters to shoot some 400 elephants a year. He also rescind, rescinded the restrictions which karma had introduced on alcohol consumption, a levy on sales, plus restricting opening hours for bars. He fired uh, Intelligence Chief Colonel Isaac Nkosi, who was very, very close to Karma, a very controversial figure. Internationally, Masisi restored warm relations with the African Union, including by attending its summits, which Karma had largely ignored. And Masisi also thawed relations with China, which uh, had been frosty under Karma, who made no secret of his dislike of the country. Masisi also began by clipping Karma's wings, almost literally, by curbing his post-presidential privileges, such as travel and protection and other stuff. One of the biggest biggest spats between them occurred earlier this year when um, Karma was invited to come and speak to the 60th anniversary of the Central uh, Tibet administration of the Dalai Lama, and uh, and um, Karma refused, uh, Masisi refused to 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 sponsor the, the, for the state to sponsor the flight. Karma said to me, I'm, I'm entitled in the rule book to four uh, external flights, uh, uh, trips a year, uh, and, 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 and has therefore instituted um, uh, legal proceedings against, against Masisi for denying him what he believes are his, uh, his, his mm -hmm. statutory rights as a former president. Um, as he said, the rule t told me, Karma, the rules say nothing about where you can go or who you can visit. Um, but Clearly, Masisi felt that that was undermining his shift in foreign policy, and so, yeah, that is one of the many issues. And, and in fact, there's quite a few legal proceedings which Karma has brought against Masisi for what he believes are denials of his rights. Um, another issue that, that's arisen for him is he accuses Masisi of, uh, of, of, of undemocratic behavior within the the, the BDP, because you know earlier this year there was a party congress to elect a new leader, and uh, and Karma was backing the f his former foreign min minister for Pelonomi, Vincent Matoy, but she pulled out at the last moment, claiming that um, her her supporters had been denied access or or registration at the congress. So these are some of those issues which I hope others can unravel in detail. But uh, this has become a very ugly spat and gone well beyond politics into the personal. Um, as Leonard will, will elaborate, Karma has thrown his weight behind a new party, the Botswana Patriotic Front, which is a kind of ad hoc informal strategic alliance, as its leader put it, with the main opposition coalition, the UDC. But Karma is unable to tell me if, if, if that uh, coalition would actually reintroduce his policies if they won. So, um, Although the, the, the BPF leader, Biggie Batali, said if victorious, the party would restore the ban on, on um, hunting, for example. So, but, but, so what, it, what it amounted to me was, was a kind of admission from Karma in a way that this is not so much about 
getting his policies back into play, but, but getting back at Masisi you know, and getting rid of him. So when I asked him, for example, is he going to, uh, what he would do if they won his coalition, he said he would stay out of politics, he would remain the patron or figurehead of, of the, of the, um, uh, of the use, you, you, use, you, uh, of the BPF, I guess. But if his co coalition loses, he said, you know, I hadn't really thought of that, but yeah, I think I'm going to have to stay in because I'm not going to take a back seat. You know? So, so uh, you know, we may see quite a lot of karma around for the next five years causing mayhem in uh, Botswana politics. Okay, um, apart from uh, how to preserve Botswana's amazing elephant population, which is estimated between 130 and 140,000, if I'm right, uh, and, and avoiding elephant-human conflict, and I didn't realize that was such a big issue till I got there, some of those conflicts being fatal. Other issues in this election include corruption, much of it, and that's something that I know that, that Keith has, has spoken and investigated, much of it allegedly a hangover from the Kama era, but, but which the opposition deems Masisi to be tackling half-heartedly. Unemployment, now 20%, with a disproportionate burden on women, Transparency, with, with the, the BDP accused of being reluctant to introduce a Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and, you know, also maybe, a, as I guess it must be seen as a hangover from the Karma era, Botswana only ranking as partly free in terms of the Freedom House's um, Press Freedom Index. Uh, diamonds, of course, a, a major factor in whether Bo Botswana can't get a better deal from its partnership with De Beers, because they are in the process of negotiating the contract, but in secret, which is another issue in itself. And um, there's also an issue about uh, homosexuality, whether it should be decriminalized, with Masisi's government apparently, t as well, evidently taking an ambivalent position on this, um, perhaps to avoid voting, uh, to avoid alienating voters on, on either side, and so on. Um, international relations have also figured uh, in the debate, but but, but not prominently, I would think, as an election campaign issue, which probably they seldom do in any country. But as I mentioned, Karma was no great fan of China and uh, preferred its mm -hmm. opponents like the Dalai Lama. He, uh, Masisi conversely made an unprecedented 10-day visit to China, state visit to China earlier this year, clearly intending to send a signal to Beijing that things had changed in the Khabarone. And Masisi has also signaled um, that Botswana will be taking a more orthodox regional uh, stance on international issues by, as I said, participating more fully in AU summits and affairs and, um, for example, not criticizing Zimbabwe's Zanu PF for its human rights and other abuses as Karma was wont to do, which quite, I think, irritated not only Zimbabwe but the region probably. Um, I think returning Botswana to more orthodox Southern African politics uh, uh, would have improved relations with Botswana's big neighbor, South Africa, which had seen Kamas too much under the spell of the West. But a peculiar episode of considerable intrigue set Botswana's relations with the new, the new Masisi administration off on the wrong footing. Botswana uh, newspapers reported that South African President Silva Ramaphosa's sister-in-law, Bridget Radebi, wife of the former cabinet, then still the cabinet minister, Jeff Khadebi, and a wealthy and a wealthy businesswoman in her own right had secretly tried to smuggle funds to Vincent Matoy's campaign, election campaign against Masisi in the BDP mm -hmm. April elections. According to the Sunday Standard, um, Botswana intelligence had thwarted that plot before she could hand over the money. Her motive, it was alleged, was to maintain or win lucrative mining contracts. As a result of this intrigue, Mrs. Rodebi was placed on Botswana's visas list, meaning she could no longer visit the country without government approval. And the Ramaphosa Center's then uh, International Relations Minister, Lindiwa Sosibi to Khabarone, to meet Masisi and assure them that neither Ramaphosa nor his government had played any part in the plot. One of her representatives, by the way, Khadebi's representatives, uh, explained to me in Khabarone recently that it was all a dreadful mistake because she had been planning to invest in a cash storage and management company, which some security firms are setting up in Khabarone, and uh, she's, they think that uh, intelligence officials thought, well, cash storage, that sounds like money laundering, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so that's where the plot, I don't know if that's true, you know, I mean, it, it's a very deep and dark one, maybe you two guys can elaborate a bit. Um, anyway, Karma has also denied any such plot, insisting that Khodebi is an old family friend. 
I'll leave it to other, others to entangle, mainly uh, Leonard, to entangle the intricacies of Botswana's complex party politics. Just want to say that one thing, that in 2014, the UDC and the Botswana Congress Party, the BCP, fought the election separately. Together, they won more votes nationally than the BDP. There are fewer seats. However, if I, I'm right, I think, Leonard, that if their seats had been combined in each of the constituencies, they would have won. Yeah. They would have won. But you see, the, the, the problem with the complexity of Botswana politics is that kind of arithmetic doesn't tell you that they're going to win this time, and Leonard will explain why. Um, similarly, I, um, I said that Kama is the wild card, by which I meant he's likely to have a significant impact, but we don't really know how, because he's, he's a, a, a both an asset and a liability, generally considered an asset to his, his new coalition in the rural areas, maybe a liability in the urban areas, and, and th those sort of the permutations, I think, are part of the reason why this election is so hard to call. Um, so, uh, economically, Keith's going to deal with that in, in great detail, but I just want to say, just in broad terms, that I, I, as a South African, saw quite a lot of analogies between some of the problems which Botswana faces in South Africa's economic problems, including what I would call ideological drag from the unions, which seem to be pre preventing many necessary reforms such as privatization, liberalization of trade and immigration. Keith can tell me if I'm wrong, but um, it's, it, you know, th there are refor clearly reforms which need to be done and, 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 and those are not taking place for political reasons. Botswana's mm -hmm. politics, as I said, have been gratifyingly boring and um, peaceful for over the past 53 years compared to the turbulence all around, uh, if you think about those, those 50 years. But the biggest challenge in its history, which the BDP now seems to be facing, does bring possible scenarios into play. So, you know, one doesn't want to be a prophet of doom, but, you know, some people are talking about a Zimbabwe scenario, the BDP loses and refuses to accept defeat. The other scenario is that the BDP wins, maybe by a landslide, and the opposition refuses to accept defeat. Um, most, of, if not all of the Botswana spoke to assured me that none of these uh, scenarios is remotely possible that their politics will remain peaceful no matter the outcome next week, that they are an inherently peaceful people and their politics are very peaceful and also their, their, their security forces are, are also very well known to be entirely apolitical. I mean, and so the possibility of them stepping into the prey, you know, I mean, if you just look at the, at the possibilities in broad abstract terms is also very, very low. But I did hear some quite ominous ramblings from some quarters. Kama, for example, said he believed the way the BDP had rigged its own leadership election uh, raised doubts about the possibility of the same happening at the national le level. And he said if, the opposition, if so, the opposition leadership would, would only resort to the courts to seek redress. But he added a little bit ominously, I thought, that he was not sure that all the opposition supporters would be satisfied with the legal route. So, you know, that could just be saber-rattling, I guess. We should not forget that Botswana, despite almost over overwhelmingly peaceful political history, history did have one, one year in 95, a student march in parliament that, against unresponsive authoritarianism that did turn violent and re was re re suppressed by police using force deemed excessive. Uh, the, those protests, I read, prompted Maseri to institute several political reforms, including lowering the voting age, establishing an independent electoral commission, and limiting the tenure of the BDP leader to two five-year terms. A repetition, I would say, seems unlikely. Uh, just that's my opinion, not, not least because Masisi has shown himself responsive to public criticism. For instance, when he reversed the decision to introduce electronic voting uh, because of public opposition. But it does remind us that unique circumstances can prompt unexpected results. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, I forgot to say earlier, so each of the speakers will have about 10, 15 minutes, and then in the second half we'll have a question and answer session, so you could drill our uh, speakers on uh, with all your questions. Okay, um, I'll hand over to Leonard now. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. I think uh, the most important question here is um, what's going on within the shining democracy, uh, Botswana, in SADC and in Africa. Um, to me, I'll regard that as a growth in democracy, as now we have seen even most of the international observers arriving in the country to come and observe, because these are just not ordinary um, elections this time around at least. 
Um, let's go back to the uh, automatic succession uh, system. I think we found ourselves where you know, the incumbent getting into office before the general elections, which is 18 months before general elections. We saw it last year, first of all, prayer, where the current president of Botswana, Dr. Masisi, was showing him. And uh, that's where we saw the whole saga or drama starting to happen. Uh, it looks like, looks like there was a gentleman's agreement between the former president and Dr. Masisi. And um, the former president moved around the country, you know, showing the trust, I mean, the citizens, how he trusts Masisi, how intelligent Masisi is, how hardworking Masisi is. So then we said, yes, these are bodies indeed. But unfortunately, when he got into the office on the first of a prayer, some of the things that he promised the former president could not happen. First blow. Um, we suspect that um, there was an agreement for Masisi to nominate uh, Teke Kama, who is the younger brother to the former president. We didn't see that coming. Instead, somebody else was nominated as the vice president. I think it, a shock. it was a shock. Of course, yes, uh, Teke Kama says he saw that coming because the whole morning of the first, um, the president never contacted him. So it was a big question to If they have agreed for me to be nominated to be the vice president and he has not had any one or two words with me, what does that mean? But unfortunately, uh, he could not do that. And we saw so many events. The firing of the director for intelligence services, uh, some of the senior personnel, even some of the BDP members were suspended under the issue of uh, misconduct and they decided to go and stand as independent candidates so there was too much drama as we saw masses reversing some of the policies that were implemented by the former president so it became a shock to us and we said what's going on he came out the former president publicly to say now i think there's a war between me and the incumbent Masisi. Now they decided to say, if at all this is what is going to happen, um, I, I might as well come out and tell the nation that I'll never work with Masisi under the auspices of BDP. Mind you, the BDP, that's the political party that was co founded by their father. So to see them leaving their father's political party, to go and form another one. It was a big question. The former president felt he was denied some of the benefits, benefits and privileges by Masisi. Now the relationship went sour. It came out and we could see that now indeed the two bodies are no, long, are no longer bodies. He came out again, the former president, to say my main objective to form this or to rally behind BPF is to see Masisi losing elections or BDP losing elections in 2019 on the 23rd of October. He made it clear he has decided to support the opposition coalition, which is the UDC. He is also soliciting support from those who are suspended, who are the independent candidate, together with those who are within the BPF. When you look into all this, you can see that no, indeed, he's trying to add up numbers. What UDC will get, what the independent candidate will get, and also what BPF will get. Because in Botswana, the winning constituency is 29. If any political party score 29 and above, they are granted uh, the win. So he's trying to play out with... Uh, the numbers to say, if I get from all those three angles, maybe I'll get something. Ladies and gentlemen, at least this time around, the IC has tried their best. They conducted the, the continuous registration, the first supplementary, and the second supplementary. And when you look into the statistics, the eligible vote was around 1.3 million. 
and they decided to put 1.1 as their target. And as we speak, when they close the doors, they've managed to register around 938,000, which is not a bad um, move. And with out of all the potential registered citizens, we have about 55% women. The question is, are they more to vote women or are they more to vote men? Very interesting. And then we also have the youth and men. And this time around, we have a very turnout, low turnout on candidates representing women. I think why? Because dynamics have changed. This time around, uh, each and every candidate who's standing for elections won the issue of finance. Funds, very important. Mindu Botswana is not practicing political party funding. So it has been going on as a debate to say, let's try to level the playground. But unfortunately, you know, the political party with majority with the DDP, they don't saw its fit to introduce it. We tried coming up with different uh, formulas to cater for that, but up to now, we have not introduced political party funding. That means, in 2019, for the very first time, the opposition parties decided to intensify their strategies in trying to spread their wins out to solicit funds because they saw that at least in 2019 the competition is a bit tough without funds uh, they will have a serious challenge we saw the ap getting funds outside the udc at least they have tried their best where if uh, the ddp are also flying with choppers into another district the udc also have ma managed to get the choppers to move another direction. So for us as political analysts, we see this as very interesting to say at least to some extent, the level has been, uh, 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 the playground has been leveled a bit. So I think with that, um, there are no signs of violence. That should not scare you. You know, Botswana we are known with uh, people that um, we tolerate each other. <laughs> and so far, yes. And again, the integrity of the Electoral Commission itself. Yes, we still have the big question of how independent is the Electoral Commission of Botswana. As much as some of the decisions, high decisions, are made by the Presidential Affairs Minister, we tend to question. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say, we just conducted the diaspora voting on Saturday, uh, where we have all the embassies, the whole world, and I'm not quite sure if really, when you look into the total number, which is one point something, 1,000, all Botswana's were outside Botswana, <laughs> while we are 2.2 million anyway. That explains why we have about 1,000 and something who are stays outside the country. They voted. But the question currently when you go to Botswana is, the standard of the ballot boxes that were used in those countries most of, especially the opposition political parties, said IEC failed to have a standard ballot box. I think those who are coming from Botswana who voted will see that the same ballot box that they were using, some of them in, in, in Germany, because that one at least it was trending in Facebook, the ambassador, they decided just to take a small box with a cellar tape, <laughs> wrote it, and that was it. But the integrity, that, that's the big question. So that is what currently Botswana are simply looking into. And said, I see, is that what we see? And there is one subcommittee member of BDP who on Saturday came out on Facebook to say, we know how the diaspora voted. Mm -hmm. And the big question was, how do you guys know as the BDP? But at least the BDP decided to make a statement to say, we are not party to that. And we'll make sure that we take action against uh, that uh, member of the subcommittee of the BDP. So we have action that colleagues uh, this time around I would urge those who uh, can afford to go there and observe our elections. Accreditation is going on as we speak. Uh, IEC is accrediting the local observers and together with international observers. SADC is already there and they have done the press releases 
and they have got a very good number of people coming from the whole SADC region to come and observe under the auspices of SADC observer mission. So this is again the election that we see most of the independent candidates be under the local government and even under the National Assembly where we have a high number of those registered as independent candidates. So it's very interesting and that explains why some of them when we look into the intra-party arrangement within political parties that is called the primary elections. Some of them lost the primary elections. And as a result, you know, primary elections, the competition is a bit tough as compared to the very final general elections. Because that's where in the constituency you'll find about four or five candidates vying for only one seat. And most of them have invested a lot of funds. And once they lose, because at the end of the day, we need only one winner. When they lost, some of them decided to go solo. That explains why this time around we have a number of uh, independent candidates going out. But all in all, a campaign is on. And uh, even the president followed the electoral act, dissolved the parliament as per the electoral act. Nomination went on of the presidential. You know, this, the system there is the political party with majority must have a representative who is the president. And the nomination of the president must take place after 20 days of the dissolution and on the first Saturday. So it went well smoothly where we saw four candidates. One, Ndabahaulati from AP, representing the AP. Two, Dr. Masisi representing BDP. Three, BPF being represented by Begi Butali and lastly the UGC by Advocate Boko. So, so far those are the four presidential candidates that made it through. And immediately after that we saw the National Assembly candidates doing the same thing. And it was a test. Some of them could not make through. Because when you look into the requirements you can estimate them by saying look for 10 loyalists or supporters so that at least you can go through. Some of them failed to get 10 supporters. And by the time IEC closed the doors at 4.30, some of them could have made it. They failed to make it. So, so far, ladies and gentlemen, it's very clear. The ballot papers are out, like I said. And on the 19th, all those who will be conducting, um, or they will be on duty on the 25th, up to the 23rd, will be casting their votes. And so far, so good. The police are ready because we don't have any other um, private organized security. We are only based on Botswana police, of which the deployment so far, they are ready in terms of uh, providing security for the elections. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, that is just what I have for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonard. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a long list of questions mm. for you, but yeah. I'll that <laughs> yeah. later on. Uh, because uh, it sounds like there are many issues in terms of political science, I think, in your uh, electoral system that we can grapple with, and that could be an example for, for other countries on the continent. But I'll hand over now to Keith, and to, just to give us some sense also where the country is economically and what impact uh, this election campaign and, uh, and the various... Um, slogans of the various parties might have if either of them win the elections. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I think as, as many of you know, uh, Botswana has quite a reputation of being a reasonably successful and well-run economy, uh, which I would say is reasonably well justified, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have weaknesses and challenges. Um, and I think as time goes on, those weaknesses and challenges are becoming more acute, more apparent and more acute. And so um, how the different parties in the election might deal with these challenges is quite an important factor that I think the, the electorate uh, will be looking at in terms of deciding how, how to vote. But um, to give uh, some background, I think as, as many of you will know, Botswana is a, has for a long period of time been a diamond driven, a mining driven economy, primarily diamonds. Um, uh, Botswana got independence in 1966 and while the first few years were 
uh, uh, years of um, the country was very poor, one of the poorest in the world when it got independence. But um, in, 19, in the early 1970s, the first diamond mine was opened as a joint venture between De Beers and the government of Botswana. And um, from the early 1970s through to uh, over the next three decades, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the diamond industry grew very uh, rapidly and steadily with new mines opening. Um, by which point uh, Botswana became the largest producer of diamonds in the world uh, by value, by value of diamonds. And the relationship, the JV relationship with De Beers uh, through a company called Debswana, which runs the, the big diamond mines, um, uh, persisted over that time and, and evolved in many ways. Uh, so. For really three decades, diamonds were the driver of growth, of economic growth. Um, and for many years, economic growth rates were very high. For most of the first 25 years after independence, Botswana experienced double-digit growth rates, uh, which have obviously transformed the economy from being one of the poorest in the world to being an upper-middle-income country. Uh, GDP per capita now is currently around $7,500, uh, one of the highest in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, somewhat higher than in South Africa, um, and uh, certainly the highest, the highest in the region. I think, uh, taking a broader outlook, I think Mauritius is slightly, uh, has slightly higher per capita income. Um, and that has largely been driven by, as I say, the growth of diamond mining, um, such that by the, the end of that period of expansion, around the um, end of the, the 1990s, uh, diamonds accounted for, um, in some years, up to 50% of GDP um, and over half of government revenues and uh, around 80% of total exports. So the economy was very much dominated by diamonds. Um, big question has been economic diversification, how clearly that growth couldn't continue forever. Um, how, how's the economy going to move beyond diamonds? So I think that, as I say, that period was, was quite successful. It's, it's a period that I call well-managed good luck. Uh, the good luck being having these very large diamond deposits, and not just very large and very high quality diamonds, but also very low costs of production. So at its peak, uh, particularly from the two big mines at Tuaneng and Arapa, Debswana had a profit margin of about 90% on the diamonds that it sold. In other words, the costs of production were only about 10% of what it was getting for selling the diamonds. So immensely profitable. Um, I think one of the, as I say, well managed, um, uh, many mineral economies have not benefited, obviously. Um, resource curse is well known. Um, uh, many resource-rich countries have remained poor or have had exceptionally high levels of corruption or mismanagement, and I think Botswana has managed to avoid all of those. The government has, I think, negotiated extremely astutely with De Beers in terms of the, the evolution of the JV agreement. Um, and without going into the details, uh, the current, so, so Debswana is a 50-50 joint venture between um, the government and De Beers, uh, but the, the profit distribution formula is a bit more complex than that. And so government gets revenues from the diamond industry through a number of different channels, including royalties, taxes, dividends, etc. Um, and the government also, besides owning 50% of Debswana, the government also owns 15% of De Beers itself. Um, and if you add up all the different sources of revenue, um, the profit split is 84% government of Botswana and 16% Anglo-American, which is the owner of De Beers. So I think, as I say, to get to that position, uh, and not to sort of kill the golden goose, um, Botswana government has negotiated very astutely to get to, to get to that position. 
Um, and in general, the very high level of revenues that the government has received from the mining sector, from diamond mining, have been spent reasonably well in some respects, although I think the quality of spending is declining. All of that money has been invested in either physical, capital, roads, um, water supplies, etc., or in human capital through health and education. And some of it has been saved uh, and accumulated as financial assets attributable uh, to government. So it provides quite an important financial buffer, um, which are those of you who know about mineral economies, um, the best practice is to accumulate some financial assets so you're in a position to withstand shocks that inevitably afflict any, uh, any mineral sector. Um, so that's the good. Um, where are the weaknesses? Um, I think there are a number of, of weaknesses, some of which are uh, to do with which are to do with the transformation that's needed to move beyond that phase of, as I say, well-managed good luck, and others are um, inherent problems which have accompanied that um, that success. Um, in terms of the problems that have accompanied the success, one is that I think the public sector has become increasingly inefficient. Um, it's very large. Uh, government employs directly or indirectly around 45% of the formal sector workforce. So that's in central government, local government, or parastatements. So government is very large. Um, so it dominates the labor market. Um, it's also... You know, you've had a situation where for many years with um, uh, mineral revenues, government was running budget surpluses. So I think in that situation, it's almost inevitable that fiscal discipline comes under pressure. It's very difficult to maintain tight controls over spending when essentially the public sector is awash with money. Now, that's not the situation now, but it was for decades, so budget surpluses year after year. And I think that led to a lot of complacency and inefficiency in the, in the public sector and, and in many respects poor value for money. Um, and you can see that in things like healthcare and education. Um, public spending per capita on health and education is very high in Botswana, um, but the outcomes are nothing like what really we should be achieving with those high levels of spending, suggesting there's productivity and efficiency problems. Um, the second issue is that mining that's, or diamond mining that's driven growth is very capital intensive. It doesn't create that many jobs. Um, and so um, unemployment is fairly high, um, not as high as here. I think the, it's not measured very well or very regularly. The last uh, measure, measure of unemployment showed at about 17.5% of the labor force. Um, but as happens here in South Africa, you get a lot of people who actually leave the labor force because they're just discouraged. If you, if you inc include the discouraged unemployed, then the unemployment rate is much closer to 30%. Um, and uh, unemployment, we have quite a young population, a lot of people coming through secondary schools and tertiary education, and it's quite difficult for them to find jobs, certainly the sort of jobs that maybe they've been led to believe that they're entitled to. Um, uh, so associated with that, the sort of the lack of formal sector employment opportunities and um, a lot of people traditionally would have been farmers, but to be honest, farming in Botswana is hard. Yeah. It's a desert. <laughs> um, and so although people would have been farmers traditionally, it's very difficult to really make any money to make a decent yeah. income as a subsistence farmer, even as a capital farmer. Um, so a combination of all of those things means that inequality is pretty high. Um, you know, along with South Africa, it has one of the Botswana has one of the highest Gini coefficients in the world. So unemployment, um, uh, inequality, um, public sector inefficiency. Um, but the big structural issue is drivers of growth in the future. Once once the the, the diamond boom has run out of steam. And to be honest, it really ran out of steam about two decades ago. 
um, but it had a lot of momentum, partly through the public sector. Um, in terms of long-term sustainability, the challenge is that um, you know, the economy has become more diversified, so a big, big challenge of diversifying away from diamonds. If you look at the structure of GDP, uh, it is much more diversified now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. But the diversification has largely come through the growth of various services sectors. Um, retail, trade, wholesale, financial business services, tourism, social services, um, which is fine. And overall GDP growth rates are okay. Average growth rates have been about 4%. Um, which by South African standards is great, um, high-flying growth, but it's not Indian or Chinese growth rates, it's not transformational growth rates, <coughs> and it hasn't created enough jobs. Um, and the problem is because the, the growth is driven by services, uh, those of you who are familiar with the Dutch disease in the context of mineral economies know that this is exactly what happens in a Dutch disease economy. When mining runs out of steam, you get growth in what we call, we economists call non-tradables. Um, goods and services that are not, or mostly services in fact, that are not exported or not exportable. And so the diversification of the economy has not been accompanied by diversification of exports and although the share of mining in GDP has dropped significantly, it's now below 20% from a peak of over 50. Um, Diamonds still account for 80% of exports, just like they did 20 or 30 years ago. So that's been the real challenge, is that we've diversified, but the growth has come not in exporting sectors. With one exception, which is tourism has been reasonably successful, although the data is, is not very good. Um, so the problem with growth into non-tradables, domestic domestically focus economic activities is not really sustainable in the long term, especially in a country with a population of only two million. That is not going to provide the basis for long term sustainable high rates of growth. So the challenge is um, what I call the second transformation. So the first transformation was moving from this poor subsistence economy to successful diamond-led growth. The second transformation is moving from diamond-led growth to more diversified export-led growth. And that is tough. Um, why is it tough? Because you can only be a successful exporter if you're competitive. And the whole basis of Botswana's economic development is competitiveness has never really been a fundamental determinant of success. But if you're, if you're running diamond mines with a 90% gross profit margin, then the costs of production are kind of immaterial. If, if your costs of production are 15% rather than 10%, you're not going to go bust. You just don't make quite as much profit. Uh, we have a huge government sector. Government doesn't have to be competitive. Even non-tradables, the whole point about non-tradables is they don't have to be competitive. Um, tourism is a bit different, but even tourism, there's only one Okavango Delta in the world. Um, people will go there even if it's expensive, which, which it is. So the need to be competitive has, no, has not really been a driver of growth, and that is a fundamental transformation that's needed. If you're going to export manufactured items, even more generalized tourism outside of the Okavango, you have to be competitive. You, you know, people will only buy your goods and services if they think that they're the best or amongst the best available. So that's the, the transformation that Botswana is now facing, is of working on competitiveness, reducing costs of production, increasing productivity, becoming more efficient. And that in some ways is uncomfortable when you haven't been used to it. Um, you know, squeezing productivity um, in the public sector and the private sector. And this is really the challenge. Um, building an open competitive economy with enough high enough growth rates by which I mean five six seven percent a year to really make a dent in unemployment um, and that's the challenge that faces the government and it's going to face the new government whoever wins this election now how do the um, different parties stack up the the BDP the party in power um, I think uh, 
you know, as my colleagues have said, um, President Masisi is trying to distinguish himself from his predecessor, predecessors, particularly his immediate past predecessor, and, and he's, he's trying to say, look, we're the same party, but we're actually, we're a new party, we're a new government with new policies, and to some extent, he's been quite brave. Um, he's done some good things, such as <coughs> removing a lot of the regulatory barriers to small businesses and, and making land use much more flexible, etc., etc. So I think he's done some positive things. Um, he's talking a lot about transformation. The BDP manifesto is full of talk of transformation. Um, moving to a knowledge-based economy, using the fourth industrial revolution, um, which is all very well, um, but you know, my view is that transformation <coughs> is not just this uh, you know, high-level visionary stuff. It's all about getting the nuts and bolts working, getting the streetlights working, getting medicines in the clinics, getting textbooks in the schools, um, getting the government computer network to function properly so that you don't get <laughs> turned away when you go to a your driving license. You know, those things are really the key to transformation. The high-level stuff won't work unless the basics work. And I don't think there's been quite enough focus on that from any party, to be honest. Um, and getting those basics to work really requires understanding the nuts and bolts of how public services and the private sector operate and dealing with the details, doing much better management. Um, I mean, just to give an example, we have high expenditure on education, and on paper we have very high, uh, sorry, very low pupil teacher ratios. If you divide the number of uh, pupils by the number of teachers, the ratios look really good, but still most pupils are in class sizes of over 30. Something's wrong there in the management of the education system. It's not a money thing, it's a management thing, and everybody's going to have to deal with those types of challenges. So I think BDP has, um, as I say, a lot of uh, high-level level visionary aspirations, um, but it needs to show that it can actually get the nuts and bolts of service delivery working better first and that requires I think some uncomfortable changes and so if uh, President Masisi wins if the, and the BDP wins I think his big challenge is in his first couple of years he will if he wins it'll be a strong vote of confidence in him as an individual if he wins he will have to use that confidence and the political credibility to introduce some quite tough reforms in his first couple of years, very early, very early on, in the hope that he can use that political capital and they will be delivering, those reforms will deliver benefits <coughs> in the second half of his term. If he delays or fudges, then I think he's got a big problem. Um, but I think that he understands the need to do so and as an individual would like to do so, but of course it all depends on exactly how much power he has, which MPs, even if the BDP <coughs> wins, there's going to be a lot of new MPs. He's going to have a new cabinet, um, and he'll have to see how he can work with that. The, the main opposition party, the UDC, um, has made some very explicit commitments about raising the minimum wage, creating large numbers of jobs, raising old age pensions, raising student allowances, and um, of course these are sort of populist commitments, um, which some of them will be under their control if they, if they do win and form the next government. Some of them are directly under their control. They can raise the minimum wage, they can raise old age pensions, they can raise student allowances. Uh, it's straightforward to do so. Um, of course, they can't directly create 100,000 jobs in the first 12 months, which is what they promise. And, and, and of course, if they do raise the minimum wage by 150%, which is what 3,000 per month means, the number of jobs is going to collapse. Um, it's not going to grow. So I think they will find those contradictions. The, prob the main problem with the UDC's commitments, I think, is that... Um, is the risks to the budget and fiscal stability. Um, and you know, having done some back of the envelope calculations, and it depends a bit on how they respond to the jobs challenge. If they respond to the jobs challenge by massively expanding the public sector, which is of course the easiest thing to do, 
um, they could blow the budget very quickly. And the accumulated savings that the government has, which are there, but they're not that big, um, could disappear uh, within 12 to 24 months. And you know, Botswana could then face the same kind of fiscal crisis that many other countries would face. So I think that uh, UDC, if they do form the government, would will either have to row back on their promises, which is tough when you've actually put numbers on these promises. You know, these are not, we will increase the minimum wage, it's we will increase the minimum wage by 150% to 3,000 per a month. If they don't deliver, it, it's going to be challenging for them. So, but of course, their commitments are not fiscally sustainable. Um, so they will either have to backtrack quickly um, and not do it, or they will do it and find that there's a fiscal crisis and will have to backtrack after 24 months, um, in which case the country will be in a much worse place economically. So I think that uh, um, the, uh, the UDC's economic manifesto I don't find particularly convincing. It's just a populist spend-a-lot uh, manifesto, uh, which usually runs into problems. Um, let me stop there. I think. Uh, Thank you. Covered a lot of ground. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was that was very very interesting, giving us that background. I think we've we've learned a lot here now. We have a couple of minutes, I think four or five minutes. So I'm going to abuse my um, position as chair, and maybe just ask you, Lena, just give us quickly an idea of uh, the elections. What is go what is going to change? I mean, my my fear listening to you and all the breakup of all these uh, little. Uh, you know, um, various breakaway parties is, are we not going to have um, parliaments, coalitions, a kind of a Lesotho situation where <laughs> perpetually uh, you have small parties that are bickering and that you literally, uh, you know, there isn't that stable government of a, with a solid majority. Um, maybe you could just tell us how you see things in terms of the parliament, even if, even if the BDP Yes, um, I think um, when you look into the setup now as you speak, uh, one, I tend to take out that issue of the hem parliament um, because, like I said, when you look into the 57 constituencies, and out of 20, 57 constituencies, we're looking for 29 as the winning ones. And um, currently, the BPF, UDC, and independent candidates. They have decided to have, well, it's an informal arrangement that they are currently talking about. But at the same time, I heard that even the BDP is in touch with the AP. So I can, th I see that most of all these political parties, they have decided, they are also thinking post 23 of October to say, if at all there is going to be a shortage of constituencies, maybe I can have a lean wet in trying to bring such of this. But um, in terms of a hand parliament, uh, there are those that we know, they belong to the BDP, they've been there, and it's not easy for them. Of course, there's a challenge of uh, the former president, you know, he's the region chief in his own uh, district that covers about 18 constituencies. So there's a serious tension. Most of the constituencies here, yeah, of course, it's a 50-50. But, um, well, I was going through the Afrobarometer survey. They show that, uh, despite that, the sample is 1.2, but it looks like this, uh, they have shared with us that uh, the BDP will win elections. Either they win with, they have won 30, in 2014, they were 37 out of 57. They're likely to win with 38, 39, but not more than 50%. If they do that, then that will be a bonus. But uh, again, looking into the competition within the UDC, especially the metropolitan they have decided to convert in supporting the UDC. So, yeah, it's not yet uh, that at uh, the panic button in terms of thinking about the hang parliament, but at least we'll see up until Saturday, Sunday. But they've been conducting the, the, uh, the national parliament candidates debates. They are also helping the citizens to say, oh, I've been thinking that Leonard is a good candidate. But after hearing that debate, people are now starting to change, and they're ongoing, mind you, and we're still waiting for the presidential candidate on the 16th. So we still have a long and other actions to happen to guide sub. Of course, when you go to the rural areas, they've already made their, their minds. They're done. Even if you campaign, they'll go and tell you. you know, those old people, they tell you, oh, 
everything is okay. We, have, we, we are ready for October 2030. Sorry, can I just, just to clarify, did you, is Afri Barometer saying 28 or 29? Seats to the VA. Yes, they yeah. said 28 or 29. I thought 29. you said 38. Yes. So 28, 29. Yeah. No, no, but the 38 is coming from me. I know. For me, I'm saying 38, 39. But seats. They get seats. Some more seats. Some more seats. Than they have. Yeah. Okay. They have All right. Okay. Thank you, Lena. Thank you very much. I think we have to say goodbye now to our online audience. You see what you're going to miss because I think <laughs> we're going to have a very interesting discussion here. Um, thank you very much for, for tuning in. And so we'll move to our question and answer session and um, I could